So we have our phones. We're secured <laughs> enough to start. Thank you so much for coming. Um, my name is Angelina Karyakina. I'm an editor-in-chief of a small TV station called Hromatske TV in Ukraine. We call it a grassroots public broadcaster. It's a long story. If you want to read it, you can take the latest IWM edition, and there's a story there. <laughs> um, uh, it's really an honor for me to be here, and I'd like to thank the Institute for Human Studies for this wonderful opportunity to talk to Marcy uh, and to talk and be uh, outside Ukraine and to reflect on what is happening also in Ukraine, outside Ukraine, because it's really hard to do that back in Ukraine with a very vivacious political and social life. Um, so um, thanks once again for coming, and I'd like to present Marcy, Marcy Shore, who is... Uh, a historian um, uh, who researches and uh, teaches uh, intellectual and cultural history in Yale, at Yale. Um, her field of expertise is uh, Eastern Europe, and I am fascinated with uh, Marcy's languages. She, uh, she uses all the quotations and the words, uh, both in text and conversation, so um, in, in, in such a a humble manner. She's, she always speaks of her languages in such a humble way, but it's, it's, it's really so much. I mean, it's German, Polish, Russian, Ukrainian, uh, Yiddish sometimes, some words. And I would say that half of the book that we're going to, to talk about is basically written in Ukrainian. <laughs> um, I'm really glad to be here and uh, to talk uh, about the book, which is um, Ukrainian Night, uh, an Intimate uh, History of a Revolution. And I'd like to start with uh, um, telling a little bit how um, history of Maidan, uh, a set of events that has been already called uh, the Revolution of Dignity, um, how people in Ukraine react to uh, different movies and books that come out about Maidan, because for the past three years we had a lot of books, documentaries, and even fiction, and there's, there's also a Netflix m movie on Net Netflix um, uh, documentary about Maidan, Winter on Fire. Uh, and there's uh, always this um, reaction coming from people uh, very often, and they would say, um, that's not my story, that's not about Maidan. They've missed this event, they've missed this story, they've missed this person, or they've missed something. And I always marveled um, that uh, it's almost impossible to tell a story about Maidan because it's a story of thousands and thousands of people and everyone would have their own personal and very intimate story about Maidan. But still you decided to take that risk <laughs> and to tell an intimate story uh, of a revolution of dignity. Why? <laughs> That's a good question, why? Um, the book came about, I would say, both organically and unexpectedly. I was here in Vienna at the time, at the Institut für die Wissenschaften von Menschen, that year on sabbatical. I was working on a book about phenomenology in Eastern Europe, which is a, a philosophical tradition and movement I won't bore you with at the moment, um, although it played a big role in the book. Um, and there were a lot of people at the time, or at least several people, which in my world was a lot, who were coming to the Institute, um, to IVM from Kiev and going back and forth. Um, and so even though I wasn't in Kiev, I was, I was somehow wrapped up in that experience of revolution as friends and colleagues were coming back and reporting day to day what was going on. And I should first say that I, I'm a historian. I don't write about contemporary politics. I try not to write about contemporary politics. Um, I'm not qualified to write about contemporary politics. Um, and I never intended to write in real time because all the advantages historians have are the advantages of retrospect. In retrospect, you get to know many more things than anybody could possibly know in real time. Um, but how it came about was the experience of being in Vienna, um, talking to people who were coming back and forth to Ukraine, following the, the live stream on, on, on YouTube, um, which is something maybe we'll talk about later, the relationship between social media and transparency and, and the revolution. Um, and I was following it I, I was following it live streamed. I was following it through the people I knew who were coming back and forth. 
I was reading the press in English, of course, because I'm American. I was also reading the press in German more than I would otherwise because I was living in Vienna, and so that's the context that was surrounded me. And then at a certain point, I started following above all in Polish because the Polish coverage was so much better than either the German coverage or the English coverage. And one of the things that struck me was the disparity between the Polish coverage and the German language coverage. That things that seemed to be intuitive to the Poles were not intuitive to either Germans or Austrians. And I, I felt how my Ukrainian friends and colleagues felt very misunderstood. And for reasons that may or may not be contingent, there seemed to be a, a disproportionate number um, of, of Ukrainian intellectuals, or at least ones that I knew, who were trained as Germanist, um, who felt very close to German language and German culture and German literature, who read in German, who lectured in Germany and Austria, for whom that culture was not foreign. And so being misunderstood by the German-speaking world was particularly painful to them. Um, and at a certain point, I, I thought, well, is, you know, what, what can I do? And is there anything I can do? Or is there anything I should do? I'm a historian. And I thought, well, you know, I'm, I'm a historian of intellectual history. So what I know about is writing about intellectuals and ideas. And I thought, well, perhaps I'll pick a person and I'll just do a portrait of one person. You know, one person whom I know well enough that I feel like I could kind of flesh out the portrait and give it the kind of detail that makes it very human and real. Preferably somebody who himself or herself writes so that I can have a kind of diachronic depth and follow text over a course of time. Um, and I won't try to intervene politically and I won't try to make arguments justifying, you know, or critiquing the revolution. I'll just try to create a portrait of a person and explain what made this person make these choices. And here comes the, the influence of, of phenomenology because phenomenology is a philosophy about experience as given to pure subjectivity, as given to individuals. So my idea was that I was going to write about the experience of revolution, revolution as lived experience. So not a political analysis or a political argument, but what did it mean to make this choice for revolution and then to live through this revolution? Mm -hmm. So you're, you're talking about the choices, which I'll, I'll get back uh, further on. And uh, I, I'll just first try to start with, with the protagonist that you have, because it's not a just one portrait. It's a collective portrait of, um, of people who some of them even knew each other. They were connected. Many of them speak English. Many of them have higher education. Um, many of them are from the circle that is used to, to be called intelligentsia or whatever. Um, who are actually those people to you? Do you think, is, is that a driving force of that revolution? How did you see them, their role uh, in the events that you were describing? Well, I should first say that the, the justification for the cast of characters, or the motivation for the cast of characters, it's not really a justification, was, was not people who I thought, you know, objectively were playing the most critical role more important than other people's role in the revolution. It was about the people I felt like I had access to and understood well enough to write about them in a way that would feel authentic to me. Um, but one of the questions that came to me was that why, well, because I knew people there, was why do people in some sense like myself, what makes them willing to risk their lives? You know, why do people who I know have a lot to lose? You know, why do people who the last time I saw them or the last few times I had seen them before the Maidan, we were at conferences, be they in Warsaw or Lviv or Washington, D.C., you know, talking about literature, you know, and now suddenly they are out there crushing bricks and building barricades and making a decision that they're willing to risk their lives. And so on one hand, you know, I'm, you know, I'm an American who grew up in suburban Pennsylvania, and my friends and colleagues in Ukraine who are my age are people who grew up in the Soviet Union. On one hand, we have nothing in common. On the other hand, in my adult life as a historian of Eastern Europe, this is kind of my crowd. Like, these are the people whose work I read. These are the people who I, 
I see at conferences, who I hear lecture, who that it's my milieu in a certain way. You know, so even though our backgrounds are very different, my feeling was that these were people like me. These are people I know, and I know what it would take. To, I, I know it would take a lot to push them to this place. I know that these aren't people who really like running around and getting shot at. You know, I know that these aren't really like the brick-crushing, Molotov cocktail-making types, you know, most of the time. Like, they would have to really, really be pushed. You know, and so what, what pushes people that far? You know, why do people make a decision that they didn't necessarily or couldn't have necessarily imagined themselves making just a few months earlier? Mm -hmm. So you, you're talking about um, Maidan as a... And Maidan is a return to metaphysics, right? Mm. So what sort of metaphysical questions are your protagonists facing? What sort of metaphysical choices are they making? Uh, something that you're, say, you're saying that you wouldn't expect them to face in any time in, in their life or yourself. Maybe you would, you, would, you would never ask yourself to do that, but they were asking themselves to do. Yeah, and this, is, this is actually a very good question because one of, the, one of the themes of the book in some ways is the return of metaphysics. And, and I should preface that by saying that you know, I'm a historian of Eastern Europe. I started coming here, or started coming to Eastern Europe in the early 1990s, when all of the dramatic events were over. You know, so I know lots of people who are older than I was, you know, who were in revolutions, or who took part in solidarity, or who spent many years in prison during the communist period, or who were beaten, or who were tortured, or who lived through the war. But, but that was always before my time. You know, all of the people I know who had been through that are people who are older than I was and had those experiences before I met them. You know, the Maidan was the most extraordinary thing I had witnessed in the time since I started coming you know, to Eastern Europe, so in the past 25 years. Um, and one of the conversations I had been following um, uh, largely among kind of Polish and Czech friends, you know, some of whom were former dissidents or activists in solidarity, was what happened to metaphysics. You know, in one of their last conversations, the, uh, Adam Miknik says to Václav Havel, this is a civilization that needs metaphysics, and we have lost that. And then really right, right exactly at the time of the Maidan, another former solidarity activist, the philosopher Marcin Krul, you know, get, wrote, wrote a book and then gave a long controversial interview you know, about the failures of the post-communist period. And he said, and the journalist said, well, well, what is really the horrible failure? And Marcin said, you know, we've stopped asking ourselves questions. And the journalist said, well, what, what do you mean? What kinds of questions? And Marcin says, metaphysical questions. We've stopped asking ourselves metaphysical questions. We've stopped asking ourselves, for instance, where does evil come from? We've stopped asking ourselves what values are. We've stopped asking ourselves, you know, what is good and what is evil, you know, and is there a kind of non-contingent border between them? And what I saw in the Maidan was it was that moment where there is a transcendence of politics and a return precisely to those kinds of metaphysical questions. Mm -hmm. So, um a lot of your protagonists and, and, and people that I know personally <laughs> take, uh, take different decisions, take different choices, which lead to different events uh, in families, in, in communities, in, in their own uh, lives. Uh, it's basically, it's a set of stories. Do you have a story that you particularly like and you think uh, it's a story of a, I don't know, it's a story of a, of a very important choice that was taken after which something was already inevitable, or something that uh, nothing could be changed after that, that choice. Mm -hmm. That's, well, that, that was one of the themes that sort of fascinated me, and that was also under the influence of the philosophy I had been studying, because under the existentialism that comes out of phenomenology, you get a very strong philosophy of decisionism. You know, a, a lot of existentialist philosophers put a lot of emphasis on this, this Algenblick, like this moment of making a choice. Um, you know, most famously, Sartre, you know, who says that existence precedes essence and we're nothing until we choose, until we choose to act. You know, and in our daily lives, that those moments of our constantly choosing ourselves tend to be not particularly noticeable or not particularly vivid. You know, and suddenly, people were, were telling me what was happening to them, and I noticed people kept using that phrase, and then I made a choice, you know, and then I made this decision. You know, as if this kind of 
moment of decision making in that strongest existentialist sense was suddenly illuminated in people's real lives. You know, and then I decided I was going to go back. Um, and so, yeah, there were, uh, in particular, I would say some of the, the younger people um, mm -hmm. in that story. Like the, one of the stories I tell is of a, a very young man named uh, Misha Martinenko, um, Mikhail um, Martinenko, who was at the time 22, 23, a student of history in Kiev. And if, if you saw him, you would think he was like the least likely person you know, to be, to be in a battle with people shooting. I and mean, he's, he's very thin and, and kind of shy and sweet and, and nerdy and withdrawn and uh, uh, lovely, smart, but, but not the type that, you know, you think is going to like go out and, you know, beat anyone up mm -hmm. ever under any circumstances. Um, and the hours I spent listening to his story, you know, about deciding to go on the Maidan when they were shooting, you know, about deciding to rescue this man who was injured even though he knew that taking the time to carry this person while he was being shot at would mean it was very likely he was going to die too. And he's the only, he's the only man in a family where he has a, a single mother and a much younger sister and a grandmother, you know, and a family without very much money and without very much means, and all three of these women are depending on him, you know, and, and the mother is calling and pleading with him to come home. And then the grandmother is calling and pleading with him to come home. And, and he says, I, I, I can't, I made a choice. I have to stay here. You know, and, and that story of somebody so young, um, you know, who, for whom it was not, even, even morally it was not such a clear choice because there were people who were depending on him. This is precisely the sense in which Sartre talks about decision making, a moment when there are no innocent choices, where all choices involve causing suffering to someone or something. And he makes a decision to stay and feels like he couldn't have acted otherwise. He couldn't have lived with himself, you know, if he had gone home. Um, and so his, his story, which I kind of, tell, which is the one that actually kind of goes into some of the more graphic details of the fighting, which I otherwise stay away from. Um, that, yeah, that, that I found particularly tricky to write about, um, in part because I've never been in a battle, you know, and was really, you know, kind of channeling how he described things, mm -hmm. um, you know, and in part because, you know, I, I, I found all the book that he was so young. Like the, bo the book began while well, I decided I was going to do this one essay. I was just going to do a portrait. And my only goal with that one portrait, the essay, which was actually something Ivan was encouraging me to write before I thought I should really write it, um, I, was, I was just trying to give a human face to this revolution. I just wanted to say something or kind of, or give it the details and the nuances that would make German readers in particular feel that this was an understandable experience for them. Um, and the person who was the, the subject of that portrait was, was Yurko Prohasko, who was somebody who was my age, my generation, um, who I, I felt like I, I understood very well and we shared a set of common references and he has children and I have children. And, um, and so talking to him, in a way, I, I felt confident about that portrait because I felt like we understood one another well. Whereas the younger people, I felt there's this additional generational remove um, of some of these younger students. And so it was a different kind of leap to understand the people who are my students' age or who are half my age, who are of a different generation, who are more in the role of being children than they are in the role of being parents. Yurko was thinking about his children the whole time. And of course, these younger people are thinking about their parents as opposed to their children. But that I couldn't help then feeling maternal about them. Like I would, you know, talk to somebody like Misha and I just like wanted to take care of him and feed him and you know, every, every few minutes he would have to take, take a break because he had become a chain smoker on the Maidan and I just wanted him to stop smoking and I wanted him to take care of himself. And, and so that, the struggle I think was especially with the younger people who I somehow, it hit me particularly hard that they were willing to risk their lives. It's interesting that you're referring to choices, but it seems that, and, and from what I remember, and both, and also yeah. from the text, that it didn't seem for for many people that they were 
taking choices or decisions in the way that, and now I'm going to take yeah. this decision. It was just something coming very naturally. Yeah. Like the story of Misha, who is having his breakfast, mm. and then he's just leaving yeah. and going without, you know, it, it doesn't seem that there was, you know, this moment that yeah. you realize, okay, now I'm going to take a decision or a choice to make a revolution. And it leads to another interesting uh, point. Uh, what, what does it actually make a revolution, but not a protest. You once said, um, was an interesting point, you were saying that um, one, of the, one of the things that Yanukovych, you assumed that Yanukovych was thinking after, um, after the riot police dispersed Maidan and beat up the students, that the parents would come out and take their kids away, and this is how the square will be you know, empty. But this is not something that the parents did. And I also remember that moment because my parents also, they were never political, never. I mean, it was just only kitchen politics all the time. But I was doing my job as a journalist reporting on the, on the 1st of December when there was these huge clashes after the, the students were be beaten up. And I suddenly got a call from my parents and they said, could you just come out on the corner of the street? And I came out and they were there, both of my parents standing there and telling me, Let's go home, <laughs> and you can you you can see the clashes, the the the, the all the, the gas and and everything is just oh. crazy. And and my cameraman Roman, whom you already know, uh, was fiercely beaten up by riot police. He was just bleeding, and I was taking him to the hospital. And there, in the middle of the square, you see, I, I I see my parents were just telling me, "Okay, let's go home now." <laughs> so it was something absolutely. Yeah, unimaginable for me and also for my parents, something they, that they would never do. Um, they stayed on that square. I mean, they came after that and many of other parents also did. This is something that probably the, the regime was not counting on. But again, uh, getting back to the, to the question, what, what made it really at the time as it was happening, what made it a revolution but not an ordinary pro protest or a, you know, a number of protests? <clears throat> that was something I was watching and trying to understand myself. And I, I felt like there was a moment, a kind of ineffable moment, maybe sometime in January after those dictatorship laws were passed, where you had some critical mass of people who made a decision that, that they weren't going to leave, that they were willing to mm -hmm. die there if need be. And that the willingness of a critical mass of people to risk their lives, that there was something that was, there was a value that was higher than the value of their individual lives, and that some line had been crossed and people found themselves on the other side of fear, which was something that fascinated me. As a very fearful person, it fascinated me. Um, that people who, it's no, who would describe themselves not as particularly brave and fearless in their everyday life found themselves as if they had crossed a border and were just on the other side of that fear. And then something else curious that people started mentioning one person after another, which was that at a certain moment, the only place they felt calm was on the Maidan. Because as soon as you left and you followed the news, it was just too anxiety provoking. You know, and, and that you felt like the only place where you could actually steady yourself was right there. And many people describe this to me about how it makes no sense because it's actually there when you're in danger that you feel most at peace. Whereas as soon as you go away and you're watching on TV, you start to panic. Um, I, I should say like in, in a PS to your last question, the, the only person who in telling their story to me said that she, there was never a moment of her making the choice, um, was Lena Thimberg, the, the doctor. Um, so one of the, one of the characters in this book is a, an, an older woman, or not terribly old, but a, a physician in her 60s. Um, again, who does not look like the revolutionary type who would like, you know, run around places where people are shooting. You know, she, she's a grandmother. She has like six or seven grandchildren. Um, you know, she's very sweet and plump and grandmotherly looking, and she's a physician. Um, and she was out there doing the shooting, you know, treating people who, who were wounded and dying. And when I asked her about that, you know, she said, you know, I'm a doctor, and there were wounded people, and there was no choice to make. You're a doctor, and you're faced with wounded people, and you know what to do. Hmm. 
Yeah, I, I think lots, lots of people, lots of those who were at the square also very often said that they had no, no other choice. It was something that came na naturally to them. Um, but there's also an interesting, I mean, talking about events as they happen and uh, the way you perceive them, there's an interesting observation b behind the title, The Ukrainian Night, and it's not only, uh, it's not only a reference to Gogol through Mayakovsky, <laughs> but, also, but also to the, uh, of a, a very simple reason uh, that people are, were telling you that they were afraid to fall asleep, mm. uh, that something terrible would happen, and this is why they, the, the majority of them mostly didn't sleep or sleep only during the day, mm. which made the whole story, story about the, the night, the Ukrainian night. So, uh, I don't know, I, I don't want to ask you what, what kind of symbolism mm. is, there, is there behind you know, the, the Ukrainian night, but still, a night, night is something dark. Mm. But still, the story doesn't seem to be that dark. Mm. It's a good question. Yeah. It, no, it's, it's a very good question. Um, and it goes back, in fact, to the question of what makes a revolution. Mm. In a certain sense, the book is about, I mean, the, the book now as I wrote it, um, after I had, I had finished the essay and an American editor convinced me to expand it into a book, then I was thinking really of American readers. Um, and one of the things I was trying to capture is, what is most intimate in particular about revolution and what belongs to the universal essence of the experience of revolution as such. Um, and one of, the, one of the things that drew me as a potentially universal element was precisely this idea of time and temporality mm. that people started describing about how they lost track of time and they could no longer remember did something happen yesterday or last week or an hour ago and Losing track of time seemed to have to do with, there was no longer a distinction between night and day. You could call people in the middle of the night, you know, even you know, middle-aged people who you know, had jobs were calling one another in the middle of the night, like not the kind of teenagers who just ordinarily call people in the middle of the night. But suddenly you could call anybody at any hour of the day because there was no distinction. And this fear of falling asleep. Um, and one of the things I became intrigued by, this fear of falling asleep, you're afraid to fall asleep because you could wake up an hour later to discover that everything, absolutely everything was different. You know? And was this in fact the universal principle of revolution, that at mm. any given moment anything could change? And the reality that existed half an hour ago is totally irrelevant because you're in a new reality now. And what, one of the things I, I, I thought of then, which is not a revolution but a a catastrophe was my, my aunt, um, who lived with her family in Battery Park City in, in New York, um, which is right next to the World Trade Center on September 11th. Um, she told me a couple days later, she, she survived, she and her family survived, that after she, she saw the second plane hit the tower, and she called her husband, who was at work a couple blocks away, and he said, run back to the school, pick up our daughter, and then I want you to run this way. Um, and she said, she said, no. And he said, I want you to go back to, and, and when, she, w when she later narrated this to me about how she initially refused, she said, well, I was thinking that she's a child. She has to be in school. She needs to be educated. You, you can't just pull your child out of school in the middle of the day. She's like, I couldn't absorb fast enough that the reality that existed 20 minutes ago was completely irrelevant because we were no longer in that world. We were in another world and all the rules had changed. And I felt like people were describing something like that. The reality that existed an hour ago is irrelevant, you know, because you can wake up an hour later to find that everything has changed. Mm, I think this is what exactly happened on the night when, when the students were dispersed. It's just that many people were staying at the square for till quite late at night and then they left and around 4, 3 a.m. when everybody left, they dispersed this, um, this little crowd in just about half an hour or so. And I was just about uh, 200 meters from that place uh, charging my phone. Uh, I, I, just, I just let go my crew and I told them, you can go and sleep, yeah. nothing is gonna happen and I'm gonna go and charge my phone and just stay here just in case. And um, I received messages in 20 minutes or so that but it was just 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 a small message text message saying SOS we've been we, we've been dispersed so it was just uh, just a small short of time that left me also insecure all all the time that you have to be on the square all the time otherwise something might you know change over 
or with some 20 minutes or so. And uh, something that the, the government and well, the regime and the militia was communicating to the crowds is that if they really want to do that, they will disperse the square in just matters of 10 or 15 minutes. But talking about anxiety and fear, uh, many people uh, of whom you've talked to were saying that um, they only felt secure and more or less calm and in control when they were in the square. But this was one of a uh, few huge historical events that mm. were basically live streamed. Mm. And we as media also did a lot <laughs> to, 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 uh, to give that anxiety to people. <laughs> Sorry for that, we were just doing our jobs. We were also fascinated with the, with the technology that you, can, that you can live stream the event as, as it's happening. And on one hand, it gives information to many people who are not there. On the other hand, it paralyzes the others who are just sitting in front of a screen and instead of you know, picking their things going and doing something, they're just paralyzed in front of a screen when you have some, some seeing, uh, watching some terrible scenes. So in your opinion, what exactly did this, you know, the revolution will not be televised, <laughs> what, what, what role did it play? Um, um, I think it played a huge role, and I'm not an expert on media, and I had never taken a great interest in this before, but the first thing that caught me was that this was a revolution that got started with a, a Facebook post. You know, and the wording of the Facebook post, you know, what, um, by the the young the young journalist um, Mustafa Nayem, was, hey, you know, if you're really upset about Yanukovych is not signing this association agreement, you know, let's be serious. Come out to the Maidan you know, by midnight tonight. And then the last line was, um, likes do not count. That line actually weirdly got widely mistranslated into English as don't just like this post. Mm. But it, it actually translates perfectly from Russian, mm -hmm. like in your child side. So it's literally likes do not count. Um, and I thought, wow, that likes do not count. That's a, that's a sentence that would have meant nothing before Facebook. It would have been incomprehensible. It couldn't have existed before Facebook. And now suddenly it's become a revolutionary mm. slogan for the 21st century. Um, that and the, the fact that people were, my own feeling, I should say, triggered by the voyeurism of watching people get shot in real time. You know, what is it, and what does it mean to be sitting there watching this kind of violence live stream, which I was particularly conscious of because I have these two small children and I was trying not to let them see the screen, and my husband was trying not to let them see the screen. And there was a moment where we felt like we couldn't turn it off and yet we didn't want them to see what we were watching. And that, that people had, it was such a kind of horrific violation of any kind of intimacy to watch this mm -hmm. violence being done to people. And then you also knew that people on the Maidan set up cameras themselves you know, to live stream themselves with the feeling that this was the only way to assert their own story, you know, with the feeling that the mainstream media was being you know, controlled by Yanukovych or controlled by Putin or manipulated by oligarchs. And the only way for us to tell our own story is to tell it through social media you know, or to turn the cameras on ourselves. I mean, it was a whole revolution that in some sense was photographing itself and filming itself and live streaming itself. And that the condition for the assertion of subjectivity became simultaneously the violation of subjectivity. That kind of that dialectic between transparency and subjectivity um, struck me as somehow essential to the whole experience. And I don't think the consequences or, or the, you know, the, the implications of that are something we've, any of us have really understood mm -hmm. fully yet. When, when that young paramedic, Olesha Zhukovska, when she got shot there was a young paramedic, she was 22 maybe, she was very young, less, yeah. and, and wear, wearing a kind of paramedic outfit with a red cross on it. And she gets shot in February in, in the neck. Um, and and she, she types a Twitter message as blood is kind of gushing out of her neck um, that says, you know, I, I am dying. And that Twitter message goes, you know, around the world, you know, in, in minutes. Um, and, and I thought this, this moment of death, you know, which in some ways is the most intimate, private experience that a person has, 
is now, now being exposed to the whole world. You know, and this, this self-violation of intimacy as a condition for asserting selfhood um, struck me as somehow the, some essential element of what we should be thinking about in the 21st century um, and something that we haven't completely understood. And I didn't completely understand the implications of it, but I felt like it was, what does it mean that that was the only way to assert yourself is to violate yourself and the only way to assert your dignity is, is to relinquish this kind of privacy? Um, I, I should add that she did survive. <laughs> Alessia Zhukovska survived. Alessia, um, the doctor, she was operated on right away, yeah, I yeah, think. Yeah. And the, on that same day. This is what I was just about, okay. about to add. This yeah, yeah, is yeah. a very impor <laughs> important fact that she did eventually survive and she's okay. Um, yeah, that, that's a very interesting point. It actually coincided with the boom of documentary in, in Ukraine and particularly in Kiev. You would meet hundreds of people with cameras and you would ask them, what are you filming? Are you journalists? <laughs> no, we're documentary filmmakers. <laughs> and you would have hundreds of documentary <laughs> filmmakers at Maidan. And there was actually, I mean, it's funny on one hand, ma many people were just uh, trying to work with cameras and trying to reflect on the events that were happening so quickly, there was no, there was no chance that you can reflect on them uh, next day or next few hours. But um, we also had this wonderful, um, wonderful initiative called Babylon 13, uh, mm -hmm. a group of documentary filmmakers who eventually created like a set of small documentaries about events in Maidan and then later on in Donbass. And this is where I'm also coming. There's this, there's a second part to your book about the events that followed, about the Russian annexation of Crimea and the aggression in eastern Ukraine, in Donbass. Um, it seems inevitable that now we have to reflect on Maidan through that perspective, knowing all that that happened later on with the war and with the people who from Maidan went to war, uh, became part of um, first volunteer battalions, and then they became part of uh, military infrastructure in Ukraine. Uh, some of them went into politics. Well, knowing all, all that and, and the territories that we lost for now, um, how does it change, do you think, our perspective on Maidan and, and the, uh, I would say all, all, all the precious knowledge that we could gain from that solidarity and from the events that we were in the middle of. And, and, and also from that incomplete grievance that we weren't allowed to have, that Ukrainians weren't allowed to have, because after just almost 100 of people were killed in central Kiev, uh, there was this feeling that the whole country will mourn forever. Uh, but then the events you know, unfolded and, and still there is this feeling that this grievance is really incomplete that you, you, and, and, and the, the, the country didn't have enough time to reflect on what had happened. So how do you think it changes the perspective? Yeah, yeah the, the war was something that I meant to write about even less <laughs> than I meant to write about the Maidan. And at a certain point I also found myself getting drawn into it. Well, I mean, one of the things I try very hard to do in the book is recover that experience of revolution independent of the consequences and independent of the successes or failures. Um, that I try to recover it as, as an experience um, that has something to teach us as an experience of revolution regardless of the fact that it bleeds into this horrific and largely senseless war, you know, and the reforms that people wanted have not happened, you know, and, you know, instead of Ukraine moving closer to American-style liberal democracy, America has moved closer to Ukrainian-style kleptocratic <laughs> oligarchy. So despite all of the catastrophes that have followed, I really, I, I try in the book very hard to kind of capture what Hannah Arendt calls that lost treasure of revolution, that beyond victory and defeat, revolution as a kind of experience about the extent to which we can push ourselves, what human beings are capable of, you know, what does it mean to push your selfhood to the borders, you know, to transcend selfhood and solidarity. The war in some ways is so much of a kind of antithesis of the Maidan. I felt like the Maidan was this moment where people felt like it was the most real experience of their lives. Like they were really, they were being shaken, if we draw on some more 
existentialist philosophy. They were being shaken in a kind of, you know, the sense that Jan Patochka would write about or the sense that Heidegger would write about, like, really being kind of shaken into authenticity, you know, forced to ask themselves, you know, what are my values? What is my life for? You know, what is worth fighting for? And they, I think they knew what they were fighting for. I mean, in the beginning, you know, there was an there was this question about you know, this signing of the association agreement, and of course the association agreement was not perfect, you know, and you know, it would have been very expensive, and it likely would have provoked retaliation from Putin, and it promised no eventual acceptance into the European Union. But after the students get beaten up, you know, after, after it really becomes a mass protest, then I felt like it was no longer really just about the association agreement. It was really this, this revolt against proizvol, which is one of these words I really struggle to translate into English and never quite managed to translate into English. Um, this, this word that is a kind that means literally arbitrariness, but arbitrariness also with a kind of sense of tyranny and the idea that you are an object, you know, as opposed to a subject that you are are basically a plaything subject to the caprices of the powers that be. And as a historian, this was moving to me because this is what you know, 19th century liberal Russian intellectuals were talking about, you know, fighting against proizvol, the sense of helplessness, you know, of just, you know, being a, a kind of a plaything to be used by the powers that be. Um, and that, and people understood that. Like there was a sense that that, that meant something, that you know, we don't want to be objects, we want to be subjects. You know, there was a real collective sense of taking back one's subjectivity. Um, my, my friend in, in Poland said to me when we were talking about the Maidan then, he said, wow, subjectivity, you know, the last time I heard that word was in the times of solidarity. You know, we were always talking about subjectivity. What does it mean to be a subject? Um, and in some sense, the war is, is the lack of reality. You know, the, this war that has become, the, the war in the Donbas in some sense, you know, has become that, that uh, obscure to most people place you know, as if in the middle of nowhere in which all of the pathologies of post-truth, you know, in the 21st century are illuminated. There is no reason for those people to be, to be killing one another. Mm -hmm. You know, there's just layers upon layers of, of, of fiction. Um, and, and it... And, and yet they're killing one another. There, there's a story I, I tell in the book that, um, that, that Katya Yakovlenko told me, I think she's actually here, um, so in principle, I should let her tell it herself, but maybe since I'm speaking English faster, I, I'll, to, um, about Donetsk at the beginning of the war, you know, about, you know, different, so, you know, one day these people come and next day these people come and those people are locals and those people seem to be coming from across the border and those people might be Kremlin agents and, and, and then the Chechens come and the Chechens don't even speak Russian so well and they don't understand why they're getting Ukrainian currency instead of Russian currency out of the bank machines. And then they call this meeting on Lenin Square. You know, and, and this, this older you know, or Christian Orthodox woman comes to the meeting on Lenin Square and gives an Orthodox christening to the Chechen soldier so that he will be victorious in battle against the Ukrainian Nazis. <laughs> and poor Katya is telling me this story, like everything in this story is fiction. Okay, so you have the Christian woman on, on Lenin Square, on the communist square, giving an Orthodox christening to the Muslim soldier, a christening for the purpose of, you know, of sanctioning his killing non-existent Ukrainian Nazis. I mean, all of it is imaginary. It's all one fiction after another, and yet it's all happening. You know? And I feel like this is a, like, there's something that I now feel very much on my side of the Atlantic well that, that is revealed mm -hmm. you know, in, in that moment. That is, in some sense, the opposite of reality, and yet people are really being killed. So what does it mean to have this unreal situation in which people are really being killed? Mm -hmm. that, that, that's really interesting because even though it's all imaginary mm. and it's all post-truth, whatever, uh, uh, there's also a, a real reason why one of your protagonists decided, Oleg, if I'm not mistaken, decided to go to the army uh, because the, um, the possibility of, of Russian aggression and of the Russian military, you know, going for, forward for, further uh, into um, Ukraine was quite real and people were drafted and mobilized. So it was something real and something real that they had to face and also take those decisions, which they did. And um, 
I don't know if you're following the lives of your protagonists now. Uh, what is what is their life about right now? Yeah. Who are they now after all all that experience? Is that still you know a process that we have to reflect later? It's quite early to make any um, to talk about anything that's been already done, or you think there's there's something else that they're living quite a different life right now and taking some different decisions. What do you know about, about no. their life right now? Well, I think for all of them it was sort of existentially transformative. Um, there's a lot of, of disappointment and disillusionment about what is going on in Ukraine um, and about the state of the world, um, mm -hmm. you know, more, more generally. Um, I think there was a... I don't know anybody who would say that they regretted that they regretted being part of that revolution. I mean, I think there was a sense of it having meaning unto itself, you know, that it was a moment of really forcing ourselves to ask questions about values. You know, that meant something that was that went beyond the successes or failures of the revolution itself. Um, but it they really struggled, I would say, especially the young people, to find a, a place for themselves. Um, you know, the young people who either, you know, who feel guilt about, you know, a friend having died when they didn't die, you know, who wonder about joining the army, who do join the army, who wonder about what it means to kill somebody, who are part of split families. There are a lot of split families in the Donbass. And wait, in this way also, and one of the things I've long been interested in from the kind of quasi-Freudian angle is, is families, how family dynamics work. So one of the things that fascinated me about this revolution is, okay, the young people are, you know, are out there protesting protesting. That's what young people are supposed to do. They're supposed to be out there protesting. Um, it's, it's often an Oedipal rebellion, you know, against the complacency, you know, or the narrow-mindedness of the parents. Um, and then just at the moment where they get beaten up and the, the parents are supposed to come pull their kids off the street, the parents join them there. It's like this Aufhebung of, of Oedipal rebellion. It's incredible. Um, and people started to say, we can't let them beat our children. I noticed that even people who didn't have children were saying, you know, we, they cannot be permitted to beat our children. So there is this incredible moment of generational unification, which not just in Ukraine, but historically doesn't happen that often, that you get generations coming together, that you get a movement that transcends not just, you know, left and right or workers and intellectuals, but also the parents and the children. And it was, and, and so many people talked about coming to the Maidan with their children, with their parents, sometimes even with their grandparents. Um, and then, in the Donbass, in some sense, it seems to me that, that the wars had the opposite effect, that so many lines of divisions are running through families, um, and, and often, although not always, generationally through families. Um, and, and the first thing I noticed was that it, it wasn't really an ethnic conflict, and that it was definitely, it was not clear that people were not necessarily taking sides at all because of what their you know, ethnic background, whatever that might mean or is, any you know, or any other background. I mean, they were also choices people were making. Um, but, that, but precisely those families were being broken up in kind of the, the opposite way that families were being brought together on, on the Maidan. And one of the young people I, I interviewed for this book, who was one of the students who gets beaten up, um, and he wasn't even a college student, he was a high school student, a 16-year-old, like really a kid. Um, I talked to him and I talked to his father and he talked about getting beaten up by Berkut on the 30th and I said, well, you know, you're still living at home. You know, you're not even at university yet. Your mother let you go back. And he said, my mother. My mother was making Molotov cocktails on Ruzhevsky Street. Um, yeah, it's... Um about the families that were split up, even if they weren't split up, they, I think many, many of them created sort of a new language, how they deal with each other, talking about things. For example, my, uh, my grandmother's sister, who lives in Moscow, they call each other, I think, once a week or every, every two weeks or so, and they only talk about weather and grandchildren. <laughs> Never something else. Once there was, once there was almost a blooper. My grandmother asked her sister about the weather, and there was a parade, a military parade in Moscow. And she said, "Well, the weather was bad, so you didn't have the airplanes at your military parade." And then she just shut up because she understood that the military parade leads to another conversation about the war and 
and they started, you know, and they kept on talking about grandchildren and something <laughs> else. Uh, so there's there's another language uh, out there, and it, and it's good if there's a language because very often there's no language, no ties, and, and no uh, relations at all. But talking about values and identities, I think you were quoting Gerasimov, if I'm not mistaken, on uh, on on the point that it wasn't about identity was about values, but uh, how, how or yeah, yeah, it was a Hitzak, sorry, <laughs> sorry. Uh, so, so how different is that? I mean, how values is not about identity and vice versa? Um, I think Slavko's point was, was that, val that the, the discourse of identity mm -hmm. is Putin's discourse. That discourse is a trap. The discourse that pulls us into trying to decide who is Ukrainian or who is Russian or who is Ukrainian speaking mm -hmm. or who is Russian speaking and trying to force everybody to define themselves. That we should be asking ourselves, what kind of country do we want to live in? You know, what's important mm -hmm. to us? You know, what, what matters? What kind of government do we want to have? What is a social contract? And, and so for him, it was a moment of a kind of shifting of the conversation, of getting out of some of the traps or the tropes you know, about the who is a real Ukrainian, which he felt like this is a conversation that's going nowhere because it's, it's Putin's conversation mm -hmm. and we have to have a conversation about values. And the moment in which there was a space for, he felt like a real civic patriotism and civic society to come. And this, I have to say, this, this story struck me because it was so close to the stories that my friends in Poland who are older than I and formed by solidarity said. You know, the moment when Poles and Jews and, and you know, Christians and, and Marxists and the fathers and the sons and the workers and the intellectuals and all of these people who had very different, in some sense, identities, all of those things were overcome, you know, and there was a kind of collective sense of, you know, we have to start taking responsibility for ourselves as free people. You know, and what does that mean? And how do we want to act? And how do we want to live? And I, I felt like, and certainly for those people, like for my, my friends in Poland who are older than I was, it was very moving to kind of see them watch the Maidan. And I think this is one way in which I very, one would think like I'm American and I'm living in Vienna, so I'm really like watching the Maidan through, <laughs> through American eyes and then secondarily through Viennese eyes. But in some sense, most formative was watching the Maidan through Polish eyes. Um, because I, I saw how some of my friends in Poland who were solidarity activists who hadn't in some sense really managed to find a, a place for themselves in the post-communist world, how the, the Maidan was the miracle they never thought they would live to see a second time in their lifetime. You know, they suddenly saw these barriers being overcome. They suddenly saw, you know, the leftists and the people on the right coming together, the parents and the children, you know, um, coming together on behalf of something that was not a kind of fetishized ethnic identity or anything else that was actually about what kind of human being do we want to be? You know, what are our moral values? What is worth risking one's life? for and they they came alive I mean they and that was such a moving thing to see mm -hmm. um, that that what they appreciated that what I felt was kind of lost in the German press is that they knew I mean people like Adam Micknick they knew that 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 kind of transcendence of the particular into that kind of solidarity they had the experience of knowing that it lasted 20 seconds after communism fell you know, and they have lived how it fell apart, and they have lived how it couldn't be sustained, and they know it's ephemeral, and they know it's fragile. But for that reason, all the more, they appreciated how precious it was, that it was that extraordinary moment that revealed that we have the capacity for some kind of transcendence and some kind of generosity and some kind of awareness of metaphysical values higher than our opportunistic self-interest. And even if it's not sustainable, at least it is evident that it, it exists, even if it just flickers for a second. Hmm. It's, it's, it's another long conversation probably about solidarity. Mm. Maybe just a short period uh, when, when, when I heard people at Maidan saying that we feel this kind of solidarity mm. not only among ourselves but also coming from, from Poland as well. Mm. But you have also Vasil, another protagonist yeah. in your book, who says that uh, there, was a dramatically, th there was a dramatic lack of solidarity yeah. internationally yeah. That, 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 be, that 
people really lacked it, uh, understanding and, and solidarity as well. And there's also another interesting story to illustrate values and identity, a story which I particularly like. There was a story about the Ukrainian sh military ship that was surrounded by mm. the Russian forces, and the Russian crew asks the Ukrainian crew to surrender, and they hear um, a, a commander from a Ukrainian ship saying the Russians don't surrender, and the Russian and the Russian crew asks, what does it mean? You're in a Ukrainian <laughs> ship, and the commander says, well, I'm Russian, but I I'm, I'm Russian as 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 a my nationality is Russian, but I took and I gave an oath, and I don't surrender. Uh, it's also a very interesting uh, s story. I, did, I didn't, didn't hear that story. Uh, anyway, uh, there are already signs in the room that we have to wrap up between ourselves, and we have some, some time for questions from the audience. So you are very welcome to ask questions, please, Ivan. Thank you, Marcy. Uh, there is a great conversation, and I have the privilege to have read the book, and it's a really extremely important book. And this is why I'm going to ask you a question that I wanted to always to ask after reading it. There is a famous book about the Russian Revolution, Ten Days That Shook the World, John Reed. And this was very much the existentialist perspective of revolution as an experience. Does it help us to understand or misunderstand the Russian Revolution? What is going to happen if you're going to talk to some of the people in Donetsk who are going to take the metaphysical story of how they discovered the big questions when they have been basically fighting the Ukrainian army. I'm saying this because in my view, part of the problem with the existential and metaphysical approach is that it can lose the political. And then all of them have their subjectivity and you cannot decide who is right and who is wrong. Mm. So this is my question. <laughs> okay, that's, that's a great question. Ivan always has great questions. Um, the thing I have in common with, with John Reed, um, and I should say, in John Reed's style of writing, um, I'm sure many, many of you have read 10 Days That Shook the World, and, and my style of writing are kind of radically different. I mean, our voices are radically different. But it's true, um, it's true that we both fall in love with revolutions that are not ours. Um, <laughs> You know, and, and you feel that reading John Reed's book. I mean, and, and he's, you know, he's there, and he's taking part, you know, and he's running around with the Bolsheviks. And one of the things, I mean, it, it's not great literature. I mean, it's written in real time, and kind of the amazing thing, what gives it the power is it feels like something that's written in real time. It almost feels like it's not written, but spoken. I mean, this is all like, you know, before any kind of technology, because it's, you know, an American in, in Petrograd in 1917. But you read the book, and it's as if he's like speaking into a dictaphone, and it's coming right out in print. Um, one of the, but you, you get from it the feel of the headiness, the kind of the dizziness, and that changed experience of temporality. Um, and as a kind of testament to the relationship between revolution and temporality, like what happened yesterday, is nothing. I mean, because you know, whole worlds have moved since yesterday. Yeah, I mean, everything has changed. And there's this, and he's, he feels that, and he's wrapped up in it. Like, like this is, this is it. He describes how, like, running into one, someone he calls a minor Bolshevik official, who says, "Okay, the game is on." You know, and then it's like, and then it's, it's faster than you can possibly think. And once you've been in something like that, you can. I mean, he. He dies very young and not long after that, but, but not because he gets killed in the revolution. I think he gets tuberculosis or something. I, I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure he, he dies very young, but of, of fairly natural causes. Um, but that nothing else could compare because the stakes are so high and time is rushing forward and everything is at stake at every moment. So you have no moment where there's, not a, there's nothing big to be decided. Um, and, and one of the things I, I found, going back to, uh, to Angelina's question, about the people like, like Adam Miknik, who are the solidarity activists, who were really formed by, either by 68 or by these experiences, that when the, when the stakes are so high, when you're formed by events where the stakes are so high, it's then very hard to adjust to the banality of the everyday. You know, that there are, there are people I know in Poland who are just, they're not really suited to the everyday. You know, they, they don't really have a kind of sense of, of, of scale. I mean, where, where they come into their own and where they are capable of behaving extraordinarily well and exceptionally are when the stakes are very high. 
And once you've had that experience, it's like some kind of almost drunkenness, but also a, a moment of extraordinary lucidity. You know, and you feel like John Reed is having that moment. Like it, it's, it's dizzying and it's drunken and time is rushing faster than you can imagine. But, but you see this is it. This is the new world. And how could you possibly kind of remain aloof from that? Um, I wasn't there, you know, in the same way. Um, and in a sense, this book is, is much more about my friends and the friends of their friends. Um, yeah, and it's much more about people I, I, I came to feel very close to, you know, and a desire to kind of tell their stories and to be the cultural mediator. But it's true that I found it, I found it impossible to remain detached. Um, and I found it impossible not to see that it was these kind of extraordinary moments that precisely remind us of these metaphysical questions like what is good and what is evil and, and what does it mean to be a human subject? Um, and it, it was un, I, I was unable to kind of write about that then from a distance. Another question? Yeah. Thank you very much, Marcy. Um, I'm really mm -hmm. eager to read the book, and I apologize if my question sounds a little similar to <laughs> Ivan's, but I would not like to ask a question about the right or wrong, but question more about historical singularity, because mm -hmm. I think that your task as a historian, let us not forget that history is an academic discipline that mm -hmm. deals with the singularity of the present is or was a direct result of the end of metaphysics <laughs> to which you're speaking about, about a possible return. And it, it, it appears to me that what you're doing is actually something that occurred in between in relation to phenomenology, and it's mm -hmm. namely psychologism. I mean, could you not have written a very similar book about Tahrir Square or Tunisia, or for that matter, the storming of the Bastille, namely what are the psychological motives that make people revolt? And that leads me to a second question, because um, you mentioned Arendt in, 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 the second, in the second part of the lecture, and for Arendt, it's precisely not the French Revolution that is the model for revolution. It's not the storming of the Bastille, it's not Tahrir, and it's not the Maidan. It's a parliamentary revolution, and I'm, and, and I'm asking that because I'm thinking about a conversation that Michel Foucault had with the Maoists after 68, and he said, people, you're getting revolution all wrong. Revolution is not the storming of the Bastille, mm -hmm. it's the revolutionary courts. Mm -hmm. It's when the revolution becomes institutionalized. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering, first of all, what is the historical singularity? Why the Ukraine? Why, why now? And secondly, was it a revolution? Was it a successful revolution? Mm -hmm. Or are we falling or you are falling into this trap of reducing a revolution to this moment in the, in the square that as we can see from the Arab Spring didn't end too well. Thank you. Uh, okay, first of all, I, I, I suspect that if I were in a different position, I could have written a similar book about the Arab Spring. And I only say this because I think of my friends who I went to graduate school with who became historians of the Middle East and their feelings during the Arab Spring, subjectively speaking, their feelings I felt like were quite similar to my feelings during the Maidan. You know, in the sense that, you know, people are getting shot around the world every day. Terrible things are happening to people every day. Governments are getting overthrown every day. Um, you know, people are making decisions to risk their lives every day. Um, but when it's people you know personally, that strikes you differently. Not because you can make some kind of moral argument for why those people here are more important than those people over there, but simply because of, of proximity, you feel closer to them. I, I, I would make no argument that this revolution was more important than what happened in other revolutions. Um, it was the revolution I wrote about because it was the revolution I felt close to. And to some extent, I think that's true of all my writing. I feel like I, you know, it, even when I'm writing about things or people, which most of, is most of what I do, who died a long time before I was born, and I'm, I'm gathering things, also voyeuristically, but about people who are dead in the archive, I have to feel a certain degree of intimacy before I feel like I'm ready to say something. You know, and it was, the, it was the intimacy I felt, or it was the extent to which I felt like I understood these people that made me feel like I wanted to write about them. 
Um, and you know, I mean, this brings us back to the kind of Freudian problem that you never, you never have access to what's going on inside someone else's soul. And there's an epistemological limit. I mean, Freud would tell you that you don't even have full access to what's going on inside your own self. So all the less do you ever have full access to what's going on in, in some other self. I mean, you never fully understand anybody that you're writing about or anybody else at all. But nevertheless, there are differences of degree. You know, and I, I wouldn't try to write about something without, it was the closeness that motivated me. And to some extent, it was taking on my friend's pain at being misunderstood and feeling like I might be able to play a role as cultural mediator, you know, in this particular instance. But the, the, question, about, the question about what makes a real revolution and the institutions, I was, I was interested in what makes the experience of revolution. What, what it meant for people subjectively to live through the revolution as opposed to what the objective results of the revolution were. But the question about the universal in particular is still a good one. And this, this does, I was very influenced by Husserl here. Okay, so maybe a, a tiny little bit of phenomenology, which will, you know, is something Anir and I have talked about a lot, but I don't want to bore the rest of you with. But you know, so Husserl has this idea that, like, if you look at, say, an apple, you know, and you concentrate on your experience of the apple and a kind of exhaustive description of how the apple is experienced and how you perceive it and how it appears to you. You're perceiving both the particular apple, which maybe is a little crooked or a little lopsided or brighter red here or green here, but you're also simultaneously extracting appleness as such or, or redness as such. So there's, the, there's a particular empirical instantiation which is always singular, you know, and there's a kind of universal essence, you know, and, and one of the things that I find attractive about phenomenology, which goes back to Angelina's identity question, I think in my somehow characterological lack of sympathy for nationalities and nations, is that it allows you to kind of go right from the singular to the universal, you know, and so you could go, to, so the book is in some sense about not about Ukrainianness or the Ukrainian nation, you know, or what it means vis-a-vis -vis Russia, but what is most intimate and particular and absolutely singular and individual about each person's experience of revolution, and then what is what belongs universally to the experience of revolution, um, and that's. That, that's kind of the, it, it plays precisely with what you ask about in some sense, the relationship between the singular and the universal. I don't know that I answer it, but it's, that, that's where I'm thinking about. I think we'll take another question. Yes, please. You seem to have homogenized the experience of any person into one similar thing. I'm sure there must have been differences in the way people perceived what they were doing. Mm -hmm. Your account of it, I take it afterwards. Now, when people experience something, they experience it in a certain way. When they think about it afterwards, mm. they experience it differently. Mm. When somebody else asks them about it mm. with the questions posing possibilities, they experience it in yet another way. Mm. When that's written down afterwards, it's mm. different again. And yours has come across as extremely personal. Yeah, I don't know if that was a question, but, but yes, of, of course. Uh, why did you homogenize? Why did you not also, why did you poo-hoo uh, the experience of other people, say, you mentioned some, some Christians who was praying, praying or something. You immediately dismissed other experience at the same time. But why, but why, why do you think I've homogenized? I'm, I'm just curious, why do you think I've homogenized these experiences? Because you put them all under one umbrella. You don't, you don't change whatever. Everybody did it for a noble reason. One, every, everybody knows that humanity has good, good qualities in it. Everybody knows that if people are in difficulties, they will help one another. We know that if people are annoyed, they will object to something. And, but did anybody ever express the idea that they felt they might become the the, um, the pawns in a much bigger power game, which actually was what was happening. I, I think, or I would like to think that if you read the book, you will no longer have that objection. I think each character emerges much more individually in the book, perhaps, than I've described them here. Um, 
I mean, one of the tensions in writing the book was that, you know, to some extent it's a milieu study, you know, a book about my friends and the friends of their friends, and so people I, I may or may not have known well, but who share a kind of similar set of references. But then there were other kind of characters that, that came into play that I vacillated about whether to write about precisely for the reason that I wasn't certain I understood them well enough. I, 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 I do an interview in the book with these two young men, well, young men, relatively young men, 29, 30, um, who, who join a, a right sector um, battalion after who are involved in self-defense uh, um, on the Maidan. And then after the Maidan, they, they join one of these right-wing volunteer battalions and they go to fight in the Donbass. Um, and they were, one of the reasons I was so fascinated by them was that they were so unlike me. You know, so these long interviews, whether you know the long interview with you know Yurko Prohasko, who is my age, or with Genia Monastersky, who is, is half my age and could be my child, they're they're people who are kind of intellectuals or students or who are who are self-reflective. So I'm asking them questions, and maybe they're saying certain things aloud or working through certain things for the first time. But I'm not really asking them about anything they haven't thought of themselves a lot and haven't been thinking about themselves a lot. Whereas Genia and Rusla who wouldn't tell me their last names. What was fascinating to me about them is that I felt like they were really thinking in real time that no one else had ever asked them these questions before and it had never occurred to them to even put into language the reasons for their decisions or what it meant for them to make this choice or who they considered Ukrainian or why they were fighting in this war and they were really struggling to find words. You know, and they were struggling in front of me. You know, and they were also clearly guys, like I write about my friend Ola Hnyatuk, who is this, she's a philologist, she's in her mid-50s, she's an incredibly delicate and refined and uses beautiful, precise literary language and wears very carefully tailored clothing and is extremely polite. You know, and to tell her story about her like out on the Maidan, you know, crushing bricks and building barricades, that's a huge leap. These guys, Ruslan and Genya, they had clearly had experience of violence before. Like, it was like beating up people, shooting people, this was not like a new thing for them. You know, what exactly they had done was unclear, but it was not a new thing. They were coming from a very different world. Um, and I, I vacillated about whether to include that material because I couldn't include material about everybody. And the material I had that I felt most confident about was about people closer to myself. But I ended up deciding you know, to, uh, to include the story of Ruslan and Genya because I was so fascinated by, by the encounter and by how they, they tried hard to explain to me and at the same time to explain to themselves what their motives were. And another question we had on that side, no? Uh, already. Okay, anyway, thank you so much. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much, Marcy. We're looking forward to the book. Oh, thank you, Angelina. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>